everyone. This is Steve Marinucci, a freelance writer for Billboard.com, Access.com, Variety.com, and Goldmine, uh, and welcoming you to another Things We Said Today, um, where we talk about anything and everything about the Beatles, past, present, and looking into the crystal ball to come. Um, let me first introduce my two uh, co-hosts, uh, first from... The great state of Maine, uh, the author of uh, The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop and and got that something, how the Beatles, I want to hold your hand, changed everything. The former master of the Beatles desk at the New York Times, (laughs) Mr. Alan Cosen. Hello, Alan. Hey, Steve. Hello, everyone. And the host of the syndicated show, Every Little Thing, uh, from the great state of Connecticut, where it'll probably snow any day now. I don't know. Um, Mr. Don't Ken bring Mike- me bad luck. Don't bring oh, me okay. bad luck. Mr. Ken Michaels. Hello, Ken. <laughs> Hi, Steve. Hi, everybody. Hello, and Ken. we have a very, very special guest today, uh, Mr. Joey Molland of Badfinger. Um, I t- talked to Joey last week for an interview um, that's on Access, but Joey's out on tour and doing um, the full Straight Up album uh, with Badfinger. Welcome, Joey. Well, hello, everybody. Hey. It's good to have good to have you here, sir. Uh, good, very good to have you here. First of all, let's uh, let's talk about the um, about the show. I mean, uh, you're you're out on uh, your tour in the East Coast. Where are you going to be? Um, and this is like uh, going through the next this month, and I believe it's next month, or is it just this month? I can't remember now. It's just this month. Uh, okay. I've got some acoustic shows next month, I think. But this month we're going to. Providence, uh, Providence area, I suppose, uh, Rhode Island, uh, playing a place called the Odium on uh, Thursday night this week. There's an uh, Odeon, that, there's an Odeon in this country. I didn't know there was an Odeon in America. It's Odium with an M for M for <laughs> oh, 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 okay, okay. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's supposed to be a beautiful place. Uh, really looking forward to it. I've been out to Rhode Island for a while. And it'd be nice to get back there and uh, play. Although it'd be nice to come in the summer and play the beaches as well. The, uh, and then we're going to uh, Newton, New Jersey. Uh, New Jersey. Do the show there. We're doing what it is is we do the entire Straight Up album, and then of course we we uh, that runs about forty five minutes or so, maybe a bit longer, depending on the storytelling and stuff. Tell a few stories about it, you know. And uh, it seems to be going really well. The audience seemed to really enjoy it, uh, and the, you know the concept and the whole idea of doing the entire record. Although it's a bit strange to us as a band or to me as a performer, uh, it seems to be going really well. We're getting good audiences, good attendance. Uh, even the promoters seem really happy with the show, and that's what that's what that is. We're going to Atlanta, Chicago. Uh, we're going down to Nashville with it. I think we're going back to New York. Mm-hmm. Uh, just doing it all over the place, really, anywhere. The Buckers, we just played out in uh, L.A. and played, um, you know, McCabe's Guitar Shop out there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we, just, we just played there. So we're doing all sorts of gigs, like. And it's are, you, a lot of fun. are you doing the album in order? Yeah. Yeah, just like it is. Uh, I even make the crackles and the squeaks, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> we, we, try not, we try not to skip, you know, on a crack. But... Uh, <laughs> Sometimes even that happens, you know. <laughs> like when when we're doing perfection, you know, I sing perfection, and and the words are a bit samey, so you never know whether you're in the first or second verse. Uh, it's kind of weird, but so you might get a crack and a hop, skip, and a jump there, and I might play the guitar a little bit, but it's really fun and it's really good, you know. We don't we don't screw around with the songs other than that one. Mm-hmm. Why did, why did you choose Straight Up of the various albums that you were on well, with Bad Finger? It's just a hugely popular Bad Finger album in our, in our part of the world, you know. Uh, it's the best-selling album that we had, although a lot of people don't think it was our best work. But, you know, it's, it's a great little record, you know. Uh, Pete had some great songs. He was really at his, uh, at his height then, really. You know, Tommy's got a couple of tunes on there. You know... It's funny, it's the only song on that the, the mic doesn't have a song on. And I don't know why that is. Uh, maybe it's because somebody outside the band picked the songs we were going to do, but uh, I don't know. Uh, but it's a very popular album, and it's 45 years this year, uh, 45 years ago, that, that it was released. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. Indeed. 
Um, Ken, why don't you why don't you start with the questions? Well, Joey, when the band started recording straight up, Jeff Emmerich was actually the producer, and no, he wasn't. Started... No, I, you know what? I don't know where that comes from because it's just not true. That's what it says on. That's no, what I've been reading. It's rubbish. I don't know who said that. I'll tell you what happened, and I tell this at the at the shows just so people know. And I've got no reason to make this up, man. The fact is, we went back to England, and Tommy and, and Pete wanted to produce the record. Mm. They were feeling their oats as producers. And so Mike and I, of course, went along with that. And um, we went out to Richard Branson's place, the manor. And we okay. recorded, and Tommy and Pete produced 15 or 18 songs. And, and it was going to be a collection of those songs was and those takes and those mixes was going to be the new Straight Up album. Now, uh, when we gave it to Apple, Apple didn't think it was good enough. They didn't think it sounded good enough. Uh, I don't know what they thought of the songs, really. We used some of the songs on the Straight Up record, but, you know, that's just what happened. Uh, we didn't do any sessions with Jeff Emmerich for that album. No sessions okay. at all. Now, we okay. might have taken the tapes somewhere along the way and produced them, and uh, but as far as I know, he was never involved in the production of it. We we got George came in and started producing us simply because Apple were dissatisfied with the job that we'd done on our own, and that's fair enough. They're the record company; they know what they want. You know, uh, we still liked a lot of the Straight Up album that we did. Uh, we thought it was more authentic and was more Badfinger. You know, it was more like No Dice. It was a bit progressive compared to that, but it was more like No Dice, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay. Wasn't Jeff Emmerich involved with No Dice? Jeff Emmerich was, yeah. He, oh, yeah, he yeah. was the engineer, and Mal Evans was the producer. Right. Yeah. So maybe the confusion is because maybe just the progression going from No Dice into Straight Up, maybe that's why sometimes it's written that Jeff Emmerich was involved. You know, if you go back and look at the record, and it's really easy... At the manor, there wasn't any. There wasn't any Jeff Emmerich. There were two other guys. Okay. Uh, <laughs> doing the engineering, there were two other engineers involved. Uh, I'm sorry, sad for me. I can't remember their names, and I should. But really, Tommy and Pete were really involved in a production of it, you know, and working on the sounds and all that stuff. So, but that's really where we did it. All the wives went up with us. Uh, you know, Marianne was with us. Uh, Gaynor went up with us because it was only couple hours out of London to Oxford, you know what I mean? Wasn't mm. that far? I remember the girls driving down to George's house, actually, during the, uh, during the production. Um, I can't remember how that happened, but I think maybe May Pang came over for a minute or something. But anyway, I remember them going down during the visit. I remember going to the pub and having a drink to do a He's a Regular, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, which is a pub song. So anyway... Next question, please. <laughs> well, let's let's go, let's go. Let's talk a little bit about Mal Evans because years ago you told me that you loved the way that he produced Badfinger. Well, I did. We all did because he just recorded us. You know what you hear on the No Dice record? That's actually what our band sounded like. He gave us the freedom to to uh, learn the songs. He gave us the freedom to arrange the songs. He made a few suggestions here and there, but he wasn't he wasn't that kind of producer. He would tell us what he liked about different things, you know, uh, maracas or whatever, uh, and uh, back and vocal bits. But uh, mainly he was involved with, he'd come down in the studio and Jeff would do the same thing. Come down, Jeff would crawl around on the floor, look at the sound, you know, because that's where sound lives. Right. You know, it's on the floor with the dust bunnies and all that. And you have to, you have to move the mic around according to your ear, you know? Mm-hmm. The only way you can do that is by getting on the floor and being there. So uh, that's how they produced it. They let us set up in a line like a band, you know, put the screens up, add vocal mics, and uh, that's how we did it. It was it was a knockout. Uh, the album came out, got great reviews, and of course, no matter what was on it, and and without you, you know, a couple of great songs. Bloodwin was on it. Now I don't know if one of these other producers would let us do Bloodwin, you know. Mm -hmm. That's it was, true. It was, it was a bit outside, you know that song. But listen to the sound of the uh, the twelve string guitar and the piano on uh, Midnight Caller and things like that. Mm -hmm. So there's the beauty of the band. You know what I mean? Uh, that's what we sounded like on stage and everything. So uh, 
it, and it was so exciting to be in Abbey Road, I got to tell you that, in the big studio. You know, we've seen countless films of the lads uh, recording, the Beatles, of course, uh, recording there and doing things. Uh, it was great. We did, a, we did a few sessions with Joyce there on the next one, of course. But it was a great time with us, and God bless Mal. It was lovely. lovely yeah. Man. When George Harrison got involved with Straight Up, what changes did he make to the original recordings? Oh, yeah, uh, vast changes, really. You know, it's a, it's a really well-produced album. It was, it was produced as good as, like, Abbey Road. You know, I'm not saying it was as good an album as Abbey Road. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. But, but the sound on it certainly was. You know, when you hear day after day nowadays, it sounds as good as anything that was put on record then. Um, stuff like uh, Name of the Game, uh, even, you know, Suitcase uh, had, a, had a little bit of a jingle to it. You know, so it was. I thought it was a really good sounding record. And I've got to give uh, Todd Runkeren his kudos, you know, for he's the guy who actually put the entire record together, you know. Mm -hmm. George did the production work on about five of the tracks, I think. Five or six, can't remember now, but it was Todd who actually put it all together and uh, bought the bought the sounds out, the drums, the baby blue drum track, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, you know that was completely Todd's stuff. Just great, uh, great work all round. The songs were good. The band was was, was really in good spirits and good shape. Even though Runker was laying on us like a big lead weight, uh, <laughs> you know, telling us he was man, he was telling us we were trapped. Telling us we couldn't play, and uh, of course we could play. <laughs> so it worked hey, out all right. He didn't you know, think you were good musicians. No, he didn't think so at all, man. I don't know why. Maybe because we couldn't play the drum beat from the weight, you know, something like that. Mm. You know, there's a story, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I have heard earlier versions of the songs on Straight Up, like a song like "Name of the Game." Which to me was was much more acoustic guitar, um, and yeah, then it was much and, more rhythmic. It was much more rhythmic, wasn't it? Yeah, um, yeah, it was. You know, Al Cooper did. Uh, people think that uh, George Martin did the arrangements on that, but Al Cooper did the uh, the horns and all that stuff. Maybe some of the string work. We did it at Bell Studios in New York. Hmm. Yeah, I've got hmm. the tapes here, man. Hmm. If anybody wants to argue about that, okay. I've got the tapes right here. <laughs> You know the two track, uh, the two track stereo mixes. I mean, not the masters. I don't know what happened to them, but uh, yeah, we went over to New York to do a bit of work on it. You know, there must have been a bit of that. Makes me think of like, why would they send us to New York if they didn't like it? Really, you know, mm -hmm. stand that. But who knows? Who knows, man? Yeah, the idea to change name of the game that way was that mainly George Harrison's idea or what? Oh, I believe it was, yeah. And it was a beautiful thing. It was lovely what he did. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't argue with it. Um, it was just a completely different way of, of doing it. The way we felt about it was it was carried from that rhythm, that digga, 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 like that, you know, that acoustic rhythm that Pete played. And we just strengthened that behind it, you know. Boo -doo -doo. Remember the bass line? Do, 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 do. Right. It just was nice and rhythmic and all that. Uh, yeah, great tune. Yeah. I just love hearing both versions. They both have their own character to them. Sure so, they do. Uh, True. Yeah. I don't want to hog the spotlight here, so you guys, if you want to ask questions. Okay. Well, I was just going to chime in and say I, I ran while you were talking there, Ken. I ran into the other room and got my co – I have the DCC version of – straight up which sounds absolutely marvelous and i guess you have to give steve hoffman uh, a big kudos on that the sound is really clean on that thing uh, unfortunately it's out of print but it's a great version uh, uh great and it has all the it has uh six bonus tracks from the original from the original uh version um that were uh, done by uh, uh it says they were engineered here by jeff emmerich they were produced so that may be where the confusion is joey uh, yeah, well, yeah. Uh, yeah, are you talking about things like sing for the song? No, no, no. This is this is the the DCC rele uh, version of Straight Up that has um, the out the the twelve cuts on the album, and then it has six bonus tracks. Uh, it says original version: Money, Flying, Name of the Game, Suitcase, Perfection, and Baby Baby Blue. And as as I recall, they're they're a little more acoustic. 
This oh. was released years ago. Um, I, it's, I think it's out of print now. In fact, I'm pretty sure it is. Um, but it, 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 it's a very nice, it's a very nice version. When we were talking, you were telling me how George was to work with, um, uh, in the studio. How, how does, how was he to, how was he as a, as a producer? How, how was he to work with? He was, he was, uh, he was very easy to work with. He didn't make us privy to, to his, uh, his ideas and where his ideas came from or anything like that. Mm-hmm. But, uh, he, he definitely had a plan from the get go. And he was very mellow in the way he presented it to us, like doing day after day or, um, you know, doing those acoustic tracks and uh, keeping it straight, doing the background vocals behind all together around one microphone, the way they'd done it themselves, the Beatles I'm talking about, Mm. uh, and balancing ourselves in there, getting the mix of the vocals ourselves. And even when we were doing the double track of those same vocals, and they're long, long breaths. We have we all smoked, you know, cigs. I mean, <laughs> we all smoked cigarettes, so we'd all run out of breath. You know what I mean? But mm-hmm. uh, so we'd have to do it again. He wouldn't let us have breaks in the vocal. It was ooh, you know, all that bit and long lines. Um, so he he was like that. He was very mellow with it. He would bring his own guitar in, plug in with us when we were running the basic tracks and work the tracks with us. Uh, and come up with ideas himself. Uh, he and I sitting and playing acoustic on our, our die babe, uh, doing an offbeat acoustic. Uh, mm-hmm. that was really an electric part, you know, but we played mm-hmm. it on acoustic. I remember he made a mistake during one of the takes, and I kind of laughed about it, you know, because it was a bit weird doing an offbeat acoustic track. And, uh, but he did, that was one thing I noticed. He didn't really like you laughing at him, man. Yeah. <laughs> Do those, tapes, do those tapes still exist, Joey? Oh, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't know what they did with them. Uh, the two-inch tape I knew was expensive, so they, and they went about just erasing things. Mm-hmm. We, uh, I know, uh, we, uh, we actually recorded songs. Um, I recorded the song. I wrote it in the studio. It was called Give Me What I Want. And, uh, you know, you say you'll give me love and understanding, you know, and all this and then you're staying out all night and all this, and I don't mean to be demanding, but I've got I've got the right, you know. Uh, give me what I want, you know. <laughs> hmm. So anyway, we did this little song and we recorded the whole thing. The band all joined in, and we did it, and they erased it. I couldn't believe that they erased it, even if it was never released. I wanted it, you know. Yeah. So they went, you know, they do what they liked, you know what I mean. I, so I don't know whether whether there are other takes or. Whether there are tapes, whether these tapes still exist, I don't know. Do you have the rights to the material? In other words, you were talking about it being the 45th anniversary. Could you put together a, a 45th anniversary with some of the demos that you have and and other outtakes and things that, that may still exist uh, beyond the yeah, ones? No, so, uh, you know, I've certainly got uh, my own demos that I did in, in the house uh, on my Revox, like... Uh, so I could I could probably do something like that, but I don't know about what other tapes exist. Mm. Uh, I've never been privy. I've never been in the studio and, and been allowed to listen to all of those tapes. Right. So where did when Apple put out the rem- their remasters in 2010 and they added a bunch of of bonus tracks and early versions of things and different mixes? Where where did they get those? I mean, they must have something beyond just the Yeah, they the must have it in the, their own library. You know, I'm sure, uh, I don't know where that library is, and, and I don't know what it can, consists of, but uh, they must have had them somewhere. Mm-hmm. I know, uh, did uh, Matavina, Dan Matavina, the, the biographer guy, mm-hmm. uh, did, he, did he have something to do with those remixes or something? Again, I wasn't involved. I was never asked to be involved. And if I sound pissed about that, then I, I kind of am now. Um, yeah. You know, but, but it, there, were, there were weird things going on at the time. And uh, it didn't surprise me one bit, you know. Yeah. Uh, and it kept on. It was okay. I wasn't bothered about it, anything really. Uh, I didn't necessarily think it sounded better mm-hmm. or anything. But that wasn't for me to say. And it, it never was. Uh, we were never involved in the what was going to be the single or uh, what was going to be the B-side or, you know, it really they were really never our decisions. It was always made by these, uh, by the record company people, whether we were with Apple or whether we were with Warners or any other record company, it was always that way. 
it's kind of a, it's kind of a strange thing seeing as when they formed apple they they said that their philosophy was that people could come to them and not be you know told what to do like in a corporate record company but what you're describing sounds a lot like a corporate record company not to well, mention the of, chaos actually you know you, i mean we saw that we saw the beatles at apple uh, and I tell that story about seeing George down there and he would talk a bit. But, you know, Apple was a lot like every other office that, you, that you've ever been in. Derek was really nice. Richard Delello was great. And uh, Neil was lovely. And, and, and a couple of the secretaries, Deidre Meehan, was great. But there were a lot of people that worked there. I never uh, saw Peter Asher at Apple. Never. And he might well have gone, I guess, by the time I came. I came in 1969, like, so who knows who was still there. But, you know, you know it, it wasn't all fun and games at Apple. It wasn't all party on, dude, you know. No. Um, maybe after five o'clock, it got a little bit of that. <laughs> <laughs> and then we certainly had a couple of parties in the basement around Christmas time. Mm-hmm. And that was always a fun time at Apple. But, you know, uh, we weren't allowed... On the other end of it, we were allowed, and only only a band would allow another band to do this. We were allowed to go in, in Abbey Road studio all day, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, all day. And we wouldn't have songs ready. Uh, we, we'd have ideas for songs. They really allowed us that kind of freedom uh, to record. And uh, the other beautiful thing they did was they never recouped the recording costs. Did you know wow. that? Wow. Well, never recoup the recording costs from people. That's interesting. Yeah, that is interesting. That is a big You know as well as I do, at every other label in the world, we'd get like a 5% royalty. The the, the label would keep 95%. Mm -hmm. And out of our 5%, we'd pay the recording costs, the production costs, the even the cover art, the photographs. Mm -hmm. It all came out of the band's money, the Mm -hmm. band's 5%. Yeah, so imagine how many records we had to sell uh, to get into making money. Right. Mm. That's the way it was. So it, 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 it sounds like, you know, when you read this sort of Badfinger story, you, you imagine, you know, at first that for a group like you or when you were the Ivies at the time, it must have been a great thing to be signed by the Beatles label, but then – it was so chaotic at Apple and then Alan Klein coming along and making it even more chaotic. It it, it must've been uh, harder to work with than you would have, I guess, imagined when you first got the news that you were going to be signed to them. Right. Well, you know, I wasn't there, so I don't know what what it was like. You came in 69. So you were after the first album. They they signed it in 68. But, uh, yeah, it was weird. We met Klein. We went and met him in his office in the corner at, at uh, Apple Apple Court in New York City on Broadway. There, right, right. And it wasn't a pleasant experience. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it, it wasn't. It wasn't. You know, we were, you know, the suits. You know, you know what I mean by the suits. Sure. Mm-hmm. So the suits who ran the world in those days. They still really run it now. There's no no difference. You know, look. Ron Griffith, you know, he's the bass player in the band in the Ivies and a great bass player, a great singer too, mm-hmm. uh, and a great songwriter for that for that kind of music. Uh, he's not a rock and roll songwriter, but he's a great, great songwriter. But anyway, uh, he does an interview and he says he's not happy. You know, he doesn't think it's done him any good being with the Beatles. Three weeks later, he's out of the band. Mm-hmm. You know, he's gone. And while well, the story is, oh, he, 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 uh, oh, he left the band. You know, now I don't know what happened there, but that, you know, it's, come on. You know what I mean? You don't leave a band when you've just recorded the Paul McCartney song and it's going to be your next single. Right. You right. don't leave, do you? Hmm. Come on. Hmm. Come on. You have, to be, you have to be definitely like poking yourself in the eye for crying out loud. I think right. I'll set fire to my own nose. You know, it's, hmm. you know, it, it, all, it stinks all that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Think of all the musicians in the world that would give anything to have that opportunity. I should paint this picture that it's all rosy and everything. But, you know, this was, uh, you know, I don't know the ins and outs of all that stuff really to talk about it. But it's just one thing nobody ever brings up. Mm-hmm. Nobody ever brings it up. The guy, they record the song. It sounds great. It's going to be a hit record. You know, 
why would you leave the band? Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. So God, I left the band in 1974 uh, because there were some serious disagreements going on. We had Crooks managers managing us and stealing all our money. And there were guys in the band who wanted to stay with the Crooks. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. What was the point of that? Why yeah. would you want to do that? Right. I'll tell you why, man. Well, you know, that leads to leads to something I was going to ask you, Joey, is a lot of people have written about the band, but has the has the in in your estimation, in your opinion, has the real story of the band ever been told? I suppose it's never been told by one of the band. OK, I've got, I've got Mike's interviews uh, that he did for the um, what's his name, did a documentary uh, a video. What's it called? No, it's just called Bad Finger, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, I can't remember the guy's name. Gary, Gary. Uh, I can't remember. Anyway, um, he, did, he did a story where he interviewed uh, Kathy and Mike and myself, and he took the story from that. I think all these other books that have been written about us, they're all based on third-party ideas of what the band was thinking. And nobody ever knows what a band's thinking. I don't care who you are. Uh, if you're not in the band, you don't know what's going on in the band. You really don't. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I don't know if the, if the story's been told. I've never read any of the books. I've read little bits of them. And uh, it's very difficult to read about what other people think about yourself, uh, what people thought about songs and what this song was about. Who knows what songs are about, mm-hmm. you know? Nobody knows. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's all in your imagination and... I don't care if you knock around with him all day. You, you still don't know him. You still mm-hmm. don't know what he's really thinking. Mm-hmm. You know, he's not going to tell you. Right. So he right. probably can't tell you what he's really thinking because it's really involved, isn't it, being in a band? Mm-hmm. You're with your best mates, you know, and you and you trust them intrinsically, and you trust them in all different ways. What kind of van to get? What kind of amps we, we need? You know, what kind of mics are the best? All of that stuff, well, you know, it, it goes it goes a lot further than, you know, I don't know, managers and all that stuff. Managers are great and some of them are brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Uh, some of them are complete waste of time. <laughs> um, you know, they don't know what to do with the band. They've got no idea about what it is to be in a band. And they've got no idea how to keep a band together, you know? Mm-hmm. They've got no idea how to let a band be. They've only got ways to make money out of the band, and a lot of them don't even have that. You know, really, really wastes of time. Yeah, you know, we had a great time playing our tours and our shows, playing in the band, going in the studio, not believing that we were in the studio, you know, mm. and recording, uh, singing and stuff like that. We had Pete Am and Tommy Evans, who could sing, you know, as good as anybody. You know, and uh, and uh, Mike and I, you know, we could sing a little bit, and uh, you know, we had good players. Uh, you know, I I I'd worked hard and uh, I'm learning my buddy Ollie stuff and me Chuck Berry and uh, all of that. You know, I was no Scotty Moore, but uh, I knew what I was. I knew what I was doing. You know, we had the same roots. That's why the others play on the Beatle records. You know, on the on the John Lennon record or on the George Harrison stuff because. We came from the same place as those guys did. Mm-hmm. We'd sat around in the front parlor with our guitar, listening to Radio Luxembourg. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, we played for years without thinking we could play. You know, so we kept on working and working and working. We didn't walk around thinking we were great like certain other guys did. Uh, you know, guys who don't know what a diminished chord is. You know? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's it's all so long ago as well, isn't it? I'm telling you now that we had a, we had a great time for about oh, 1970 through like 1973. The band was on. Mm-hmm. You know, the band was on. And we developed we developed our own style. I know uh, we had all the same influences as all the other bands in the world. We had all the same influences as the Beatles and the Beatles as well, you know? Mm-hmm. We were finding out about B.B. King. We were hearing guys like Leslie West and the band. Uh, but we also had our little Richard and, our, you know, our Chuck Berry and all of that stuff. 
And we were incorporating all of those things into the music. If you listen to our music, you can hear it all in there, you know. But, I mean, who could ever tell you that, that uh, you know a drummer that was like Mike Gibbons? Because you don't, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, the guy had a remarkable thing going just for himself. Uh, Pete was one of the greatest slide guitar players on the planet. And I mean, bar none. Bam, none. And it's on record for people who hear, you know? Mm -hmm. Astounding guitar player. And I'm not talking about do, 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 do. You no, know, anybody could do that in six and a half hours, you know? But you do a jam like the end of Island or something like that. Uh, you can hear the guy playing the guitar then, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Jumping all over and just fantastic. And he could do that on stage. And he could do it on the same guitar that he played regular guitar with. You know, there wasn't a special guitar adjusted, you know, to play slide. Hmm. Uh, he could do it. He could do it. And uh, we could all play the piano to a certain degree. And that's where the piano on our records is very simple and kind of guitar player like, you know. So when, when you say that he played on the same guitar as uh, slide on the same guitar as he used for regular guitar, did he also use the same tuning or did he retune it for slide? Uh, he retuned the uh, the E string down to D, the first. Mm -hmm. okay. That would give you major chords. That would give you major chords on it. Right. And it would also give you the ability to play sevenths mm. in the blues uh, frame. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Joey, okay. how does your how does your um, how does your Warner Brothers uh, output compare to the Apple in your estimation? Yeah, I think it was every bit as good. Mm -hmm. um, I was a little bit worried about when we were doing the first Warner album. You know, a couple of the songs were deliberate kind of attempts at singles, mm -hmm. and uh, we'd never done that before. Uh, you know, Baby Blue wasn't written as a single; it was just written as a song. Same with Day After Day. Same with all the songs on that record. Uh, but, you know, uh, and, and I've got to uh, say this, um, Tommy Evans wanted, uh, desperately, wanted all his career to write a hit single. He was, he was made up when maybe Tomorrow came out, and it was a big disappointment to him when it wasn't a big, giant hit. Uh, I mean, very disappointing to him. And so... Uh, he would spend his, his, his time, besides writing the great songs that he wrote, you know, songs from like, uh, like It's Over, which is just a little song, but it says so much, to, uh, you know, Lost Inside Your Love later on, which is absolutely brilliant, you know, um, and, and relates back in, into his, uh, uh, you know, into the early days playing um you know, so the band wrote songs and we brought them and we played and recorded the ones we liked. That was generally what it was. Straight up, not so much. Uh, but uh, George, um, and I will say this about George, he arranged the songs to be singles. You know, mm -hmm. uh, he arranged day after day to be a single. He arranged suitcase to be a single. He arranged ba uh, die babe to be a single. So, uh, you know, when we got to the first Warner album, there was, there was a little bit of that conscious effort. Shine On was a conscious effort uh, to write a single. Uh, what's the other one, uh, which is blatantly singlish? Um, I, can't, I can't believe it. I remember Tommy and Pete coming in the room, in my little room in Park Avenue, and, uh, asking me, uh, have you got an idea for this, you know? And uh, what song was it now? And what I did was I, I took the chorus of uh, Eight Days a Week and, and uh, <laughs> I put it in the song. I thought it was great work, great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the one it was. And if you listen to it, I think, that, well, I don't know what record that's on, actually, but there were certain blatant ideas that were coming out, like, right, let's write a single, you know. And I don't know, are you writing a single? I've got no idea how to do it. I don't know what a single is. <laughs> you know, this day I don't know what a single is. Mm -hmm. you know, never had a single. I think I've had like top sixties, top fifties, and you know I had a couple of hits. I when I was a boy in Japan with Gary Walker, but I don't know what a single is. I've got no idea. Mm. 
Hmm, that's still, funny. That's still, why that's why you need people at record companies sometimes to make that decision, though they don't always make the right ones. Yeah, that, you're but, exactly right. That's exactly right. That's why you need a great producer, you know, like a George or a Todd, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But well, definitely, you know, you know, you're talking about the Warners albums. When, when Wish You Were Here came out, Just a Chance or No One Knows, those could have easily have been big hits yeah, to me anyway. Was, not, was No One Knows released as a single? No. I'm not sure. <laughs> you know, the album was shelved, wasn't it? Before it had a chance because of the lawsuit. Mm. You know what happened? I'll tell you this. I don't know whether anybody's told this story. But I'm sitting with Ed Silver one day. He was the head of Apple. I mean, Warner Music. I mean, the head of Warner Music. I'm sitting with him. And this is after the bands broke up. And he told me that he, he woke up one morning with an itch uh, about the, the Badfinger advances which was supposed to be in an, an escrow account. And he went and had a look at that escrow account. He found out a bunch of the money wasn't there. And uh, he called Joe Smith. Uh, 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 Joe is a great guy, you know, Joe Smith, a lovely man. But anyway, um, he, he, uh, they both in- investigated it and wish your ear was out. came out then. And uh, it was doing really well. But they found the money was missing, and they sued us for it, the 385 grand or something. And uh, they sued Badfinger for it because we'd signed the contract. If they could have, they would have sued the managers because they knew the managers had taken the money. Mm. You know? Mm. Uh, just unbelievable. Unbelievable. So what good was um, it to sue you? Well, it wasn't. We were just talking about it because it was past tense to us. Mm-hmm. You know, we were just talking about it. I'd never really met Ed Silver. You know, and I was just happened to be in Warner Brothers. I don't even know what I was there for. But we started to talk about the bad finger thing, and he told me about it. You know, yeah. And, and it was just an itch. And he found out. We suffered terribly for it. Led to led to a lot of disagreements because it really brought to light the kind of people uh, that were running our business. You know, the crooked accountants on Wall Street, the guy on Central Park South. The agents, you know, I've got CDs from uh, Becca, uh, the promoter. Uh, he, he put out CDs. Uh, he started taping the phone calls from the managers that were doing the deals uh, behind the scenes and were never telling the bands. You know, and they all used to work together. <laughs> oh, oh boy. I don't know if you know about these things, but this is how it is. That's the way the show business works. You know, it's... It's kind of like the government, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, if you want to go there, nobody wants to go there, though. Um, <laughs> you have to want to really go there, but the music business, because it stinks, you know? It stinks, you know? Hmm. Just the way it's Sony TVs, you know, Cadillacs, uh, you know, all of that, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It sucks. <laughs> but well, playing music is the greatest way to earn a living, and they can't take that away. Mm-hmm. Right. They can't take that away. The only reason they bother with having musicians and bands is because we're the only ones that can play. <laughs> we're the only ones that can sing. We're the only ones who can make the musical. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. They just don't want to have to pay you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. They'd love it. They'd love it. I don't. You know how many musicians are out there now that were famous, super famous. And it broke. You know, I remember when my kids were born. I'm not kidding. I had no money at all. We were on the radio all over the world. I had no money at all. Hmm. I stood outside Pasadena Hospital in the poor man's line holding my baby, trying to get treatment. Hmm. Yeah? Thinking Hmm. my youngest baby was going to die. You know? Maybe he wasn't, but that's what I was thinking. Sure. And I had no money and I wanted to kill this guy, you know, because we never spent the money. We never spent the money. You know, Mm. you could buy a really good guitar in those days for 300 bucks. We were selling out thousand, two thousand, three thousand, five thousand seats a night. And we were doing 120 nights a year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We were making 300,000 a record. We'd get letters from Apple saying, we sent your manager $250,000 to take, or £250,000, which was, I don't know, a million dollars, you know? 
It would go and disappear. We, we weren't even allowed to buy, ooh, I don't know, we, we want to buy a house. There's not enough money. Yeah. You want to buy a car? Oh, no, I can't do that. On the night Peter, uh, or the day before Peter hung himself, he was told he had no money. Well, this guy wrote, without you, day after day, baby blue, no matter what, hmm. you know, and all the other songs on the records. Well, I wrote a few more, actually, but he wrote all those hits, man. And you know how rich he should have been, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No money. No money. Not some money, but no money. That's right. You better go record another album so we can get some more money. And this was a guy who lived in an attic, spent his days writing songs. He -hmm. spent so much time doing it that he wrote a song about take a day off. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. (laughs) When we talked last week, Joey, you mentioned a great story, and you reminded me of it when you mentioned Without You. When Harry Nilsson told you guys that he was doing it, would you tell that story for people who didn't see what I wrote last week? Because that was such a great story. Sure. Uh, We were in Air Studios in London, and I'm not sure what record we were were recording, but we're going doing a session this one day, and in walks Harry Nilsson. Uh, tweed coat, you know, the Harry that we all know in straw hair, you know. <laughs> and uh, he comes in and he's very mellow and very, you know, hello, uh, my name's Harry Nielsen. And wow, we, of course, we knew of Harry Nielsen, but we didn't really know him or anything. We never met him. And wow, Harry Nielsen, you know, uh, a genius, really. And uh, uh, he, he was really sweet, you know, love it and all that stuff. He said, hey, I wonder if you'd do me a favor. Just we're mixing my new record down the hallway, be doing it all day. I wonder if you'd come and listen to a couple of things and tell us what you think of the sound. You know, we're not really sure if we're going too far with this or whatever. And you get that way when you record and you, you listen to the song so much, you don't know if it's any good anymore, you know? Uh, and you go past the, the good mixes and then you end up with a, with a crap mix, you know? So, mm. uh, so you know, we, we took it all quite seriously. I'm well, sure we will, yeah, you know. Maybe we were just stupid. I don't know. But we walked down the hallway and took us in the, in the studio there and in, in, introduced us uh, to Perry, Mr. Perry. Uh, I think Rupert Perry, was it, or Richard? Richard, Richard Perry. Perry. Richard Perry. Yeah, Richard Perry, yeah. And he said, uh, Richard, these are the Badfinger uh, band. And uh, I was asking them to listen to a couple of mixes. Uh, fancy playing them something. And of course, he played us the mix for Without You. And <laughs> man, it sounded awesome, fantastic, you know, really. And the vocals were incredible there. And the, 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 the song sounded beautiful, it really did. And... Um, you know, our manager, Bill Collins, was, was with us. He was our personal guy, like our personal roadie kind of guy. And uh, he'd been telling us for years since we'd done Without You that we should do a big bombastic version like Nielsen had done. And you should have look on his face, you know, I told you so, was, uh, was so much. And, of course, Harry went on and won, won all the awards with it. Actually won Tommy and Pete awards uh, because it was such a great record. So that's the story of it for us. And we went back to the rooms kind of talking amongst ourselves, you know, Jesus, you know. <laughs> and they're talking about feelings, you know, kind of silly, but, you know, just one of those things. But that's the story behind it. And I think that's what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. I was listening this week to some of the band on the, on the BBC from the early 70s, and you guys were really – they're, uh, they're, they're, uh, I mean, it, we've heard you on on the studio sessions, but the the live sessions on the BBC they were they were definitely different. You they were a lot more forceful. Can you talk about the difference between what you were like in the studio and what you were like live and uh, you know on the BBC and in concert? Of course, I can. We we after we got successful, uh, we come and get it, and, and uh, no matter what, we we started touring. And at the same time, this was 71, wasn't it, 72? Mm -hmm. At the same time, the bands were coming out. uh, We'd been listening to a bit of Cream and all that, of course. They'd been out for a couple of years already. But uh, the bands were coming out with these long, jammy records, Almonds. And people liked that. You know, the the songs were getting longer and longer and jammier and jammier. And and we, we started to do that on stage quite naturally. We started to reach a little bit. 
uh, we were getting devices, echo devices and stuff that we'd never had before uh, to play with. Fuzz boxes and wah-wahs and even, uh, I think, synthesizers were out then and, and stuff. And there were guitar synthesizers or like uh, um, the Mutron effects. I've still got some of them. And uh, Pete particularly started to use them on stage. And the Echoplex was an unbelievable device. Uh, you, you could you could make the echo go on forever, or you could stop it on a dime like a like you stood on the brake. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, you could really do them. They were like mechanical devices. Uh, so um, it was it was a great time for us. And so the music naturally got like that. We started taking other people's songs, uh, like only you know and I know, and uh, feeling all right. And Tommy would let his voice go, um, and Pete and I would would start to jam. And Mike was listening to Mahavishnu now. Uh, and, you know, Mike used to drive around England in this Rover 3000 car, which was the cop car of the day. Uh, super fast, and super hairy. And uh, he, had a, he had a headphone put in the dashboard, right? <laughs> and he, he wired up to his, uh, his, his tape cassette player, and he'd play Mahavishnu orchestra, just blast him, and race around country roads in England. So... The, this was the lifestyle we were living, and we were getting a little bit stoned and stuff, and uh, you know, doing a little bit of this, a little bit of that. You know, and we never got really excessive with the dope. We never did that, but we did do a little bit here and there, you know. And uh, you know, it changes your mind. You know, there's no doubt about that. You know, that's one of the things that I loved about it when, when I was doing it. Uh, don't do it anymore. Uh, don't really, don't really drink anymore either, for that matter. Uh, once in a blue, you know, I'll, I'll, maybe, you know, I don't know, a couple of beers or something, but I'm not a real drinker anymore. I used to love it, brandy. And, you know, it was just the way of the world at the time. The music was jammy, you know what I mean? <laughs> I don't know if it's still like that. I think bands like Fish are supposed to be doing that kind of stuff. And, sure. uh, I guess they're an old band now, I don't know. But, uh, but you listen to the bands the past five, five maybe ten years, uh, the songs are short and sweet. You know, three three minutes. Mm-hmm. You know, it's back to, back to the single. You know, uh, you know, it's it, you know, it's it's just back to the same old, same old, isn't it? Really, mm-hmm. you know. Mm. I'm not no, not trying to say anything about the singers or or uh, players nowadays. They're every bit as good. I think uh, they've got to be. Uh, I don't think there's any special in any particular age, unless you're talking about a guy like McCartney, who's a you know a one in a billion kind of guy. Mm-hmm. You know, no, there's all the rest. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, but there are once every few hundred years, there's a guy like that. You know, writes melody all day long. He gets out of bed with melody in his pocket. You know, it's, you know, I don't know. He gets him on the bus. You know, he has the bell ring on the bus, and then he gets an idea. You know, <laughs> so, uh, you know, it is fantastic, man. Uh, can you imagine if he really put his mind to it? What would happen? Mm-hmm. Maybe, you know, it would Have you- it's out of everybody. Have you had any contact with Paul or Ringo no, recently? I, I've never met him. I've been in his dressing room, but I'm so nervous around him. <laughs> uh, I've never really been able to go up and introduce myself to him. Uh, I really, I really do think that he's something really special. You know, and I think we're really lucky to be alive around that. Mm-hmm. Uh, just absolutely brilliant. You know, the Beatle, the Beatle phenomenon is, is unbelievable in terms of music history. Mm-hmm. What happened? You know, the the the, the better the, the more the music progressed, the less he played. Right. Know, how does that work? How does that work? Mm-hmm. You know, uh, um, it's just amazing. You know, but the beat was still as good. You know, the the uh, the harmonies were still as good and punchy. It was just really incredible the phenomena of it. You know, I was astounded. Nobody else was doing that. Nobody else did it. You know, people mm-hmm. so thought because. And put a folk music on the record that they were being progressive or something. Mm-hmm. You know, it's amazing. It's amazing what those guys did. Yeah, it, it mm. really is. Where? So you're going to be the next couple of dates you have, uh, or where can people get information about the tour with the dates? Yeah, Where's, a bit what's your, our website? What's your on website? The, on the badfingersite.com. A little bit on there. And, and there's some on Facebook by people who have gone to the shows. And I think... Um, the list of dates is on our website, and Although, I have it on my I have it on my access story as well. Yeah, you have it on your sites. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm. 
you know, it's, and it's again, it's 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 a, a band that I'm leading. Uh, four guys from from uh, the East Coast, uh, predominantly. Uh, boss, so a guy from Boston, uh, a couple of guys in the New York area, and um, I think actually, and a Frenchman uh, playing drums. French guy, it's great band. <laughs> So I've got these four young guys who are all really good singers, uh, or rather the three of them, the drummer doesn't sing, uh, which, uh, you know, <laughs> you can say what you like about, but he's a great drummer. So I've got this young band singing the songs with me, and they sing lead on things like uh, Name of the Game, Take It All, and they lend that beautiful tenor that a young man have, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm seven years old now, and uh, I can still sing songs, but but uh, I, I I tend to just sing my songs, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I do sing along on Baby Blue. I sing a bit on uh, Day After Day. Uh, sing on uh, uh, you know successful conversation. There is no perfection, you know. Sing a bit on that. But the guys sing it's over, and it's this is going around really well. I gotta tell you, people are really enjoying it. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of people out there who still really like that record. Mm -hmm. And the idea of airing it all in order, which is a bit weird. You know, to do an album uh, in order is a bit odd. Mm -hmm. And you have it's, an out. Al speaking of albums, you have one in the works yourself. Yeah, I do. Uh, I've got a stack of songs, and uh, I gave all the demos to uh, Mark uh, Hudson. I did a couple of tunes with him uh, in New York about two years ago now. We went in the studio just to see. And uh, I think they turned out really well. I don't think they're the best songs that we've got, but, but I think they were good songs. And um, Hudson is so great at production. Uh, and, I, you know, I'll say that again. Hudson is so great at production. <laughs> that I can't wait to do it. Uh, he's magnificent. You know, he's, he, it's, it's remarkable to work with the guy. The energy, the speed that he works at, uh, the way he takes a song gets right into it with you, pulls it apart, puts it back together, and you've got this beautiful thing. It's great. You know, I don't know. I'm, I, I write songs because I get ideas, uh, you know, walking down the street or get an idea about it, you know. Or, or something bothers me and I want, I want to say something about it. Or I'm in love and I want to say something about that. So, you know, I write my songs, but I'm not necessarily a good arranger. I'm not necessarily... Uh, you know, uh, anything like that, especially to do with my own songs, because I don't, I don't walk around blowing my own trumpet, you know what I mean? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, uh, <laughs> you know these guys out there, you know, they're, they're geniuses, man, you know, so oh. I don't know, they get a bit cutting with themselves, I think, but, you know. How soon will, how soon are you looking, because it sounds like you're just in the beginning stages on the album, have you got a timeline as far as the release of it? No, no, I haven't. Mark is always busy. Like, he's so great that the minute he finishes a project, somebody comes along with 50 grand. And, uh, <laughs> you know, they snap him up, you know what I mean? And he's not all about money. But he's like everybody else. He likes to make a bit of money, you know? So what the mm -hmm. hell? Mm. Uh, so we'll get it done one day, if good Lord willing, you know? And that's a big, important deal we forget about, too. You know? Yeah, man. Can, Can I ask uh, go ahead, Ken. A, a few questions. Going back to the Straight Up album, um, is it true that George Martin did work on, say, the arrangement of uh, the medley of um, Flying and Money? Uh, I think he did, uh, but I can't believe that George would do something so unmusical as uh, speed it up. You know, so the so the Flying was in the same key as Money. You know, it didn't matter that it didn't matter that it sounded like shit. Yeah? <laughs> no, that's what it does. Uh, it just it kind of ruined the segue, you know, between the two songs. Honest to God, I sound like Mickey Mouse. And I'm dying to say, easy. You know, it doesn't work. And you can hear that. If you're deaf, you can hear that. Mm -hmm. So I can't believe that George that, that uh, George Martin did. I had anything to do with that, but I think he did. He did do something along the way somewhere, but I'm not sure what. Did uh, you ever get to meet George Martin? No. Okay. So I was only in the band. You know, it's, I only played in the band. I only sang half of the songs. I only wrote half of the music. <laughs> I only played the solos on all the big hit records. You know, but it's remarkable. 
<laughs> I remember George coming in on day after day. I don't mean to lie about that. I was playing the slide. And here's something I just thought of the other day. Uh, we were sitting in the studio, the Studio 3, the little studio at Abbey Road. Pete and I sitting on stools with our strats. And we were working it out, do, 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 whatever we were playing. Uh, it wasn't what they ended up playing. And George came in and he asked, would it be okay? Could he play a bit of slide? He fancied, you know, he had an idea or something, you know. So and I took my slide, my guitar off and said, sure, man, you know, yeah. right, right away. And uh, he got and he took my guitar and he worked and he played it on day after day. And then I played the same guitar for about a year. And it was great what they did, wasn't it? You know, and it was beautiful. They did it live together, you know. Mm-hmm. They have to, those guitars are recorded together. That's why it took so long, because there's little pitches that happen on slide guitar, you know. And they played it with regular tuning as well. Mm-hmm. You know, the guitar with the guitars, the guitars weren't tuned to chords or nothing, except for that first, you know, to tune it down to D. Really makes a big difference. But anyway... I took that guitar and without thinking about it, I sold it. And I sold it for like 100 bucks or something, 200 bucks. You know, so there's no offender. Threw it up in the, in the air at, I think, O'Keefe Center in Toronto. I broke a string at the edge of this, at the end of this solo. It was like a jam, you know. Uh, and we were wailing away and I was having a great time and a string broke. And I took the guitar and threw it up into the the, uh, the lights, you know. <laughs> and it was like, oh, boosh. And it came down and it kind of folded up and all the springs jumped out and everything. And uh, the roadie actually went back. Fergie got all the bits and put it all back together at the end of the show. But it split, it split the body a little bit. It was never the same, really. Anyway, I got rid of it. And I never oh. thought that it's the guitar that George Harrison played, oh. you know, on the, on day after day, you know. It's just weird, you know, because you didn't think of these things in those days. You know, they sold that guitar that George gave the band for three quarters of a million dollars. Mm-hmm. Oh. Could have bought myself a house in there if I would have kept that strat, you know. So. Mm-hmm. Really amazing. Sure. Does the Joey. person you sold it to know its its involvement on that song and that George played? Oh, yeah, but he probably did. He probably broke it to pieces and... and, and you know, put new pickups in it and did all this stuff to it, you know, like do. Mm. But no, he didn't know that. He didn't know that. I don't believe so. Same with the acoustic guitar I played on uh, Bangladesh, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Speaking right. of Bangladesh, you know, what was it like for you to play at that show? And was there ever a chance that Badfinger would get to do a song? It was always a shame that, you no, know, no. They, had, they had a few hits by then. So... That- we had, and I think I think Baby Blue was actually in the charts at the time, <laughs> but it never even came up. And Badfinger certainly never, never. We never had the ego. Uh, not even one of us had the ego where we would go to George and say, "Hey, can we do one of our songs?" We would never have done it. Mm. You know, we had George Harrison there. Uh, Leon Russell was there. Uh, Billy Preston was there. Eric Clapton was there. You know, all these the, and. and there were great songwriters in the lineup of the backup singers. You know, uh, there, there were great people at that concert. Mm-hmm. Also, incredible play. And so we always felt uh, like we were, the, we were the bottom of the deck, if you like. We were, the, we were the kids. We were just learning what we were doing. And, you know, yeah, we'd had a couple of hits, but so what? You know, we did the best we could, uh, but we never really thought it was good enough. Uh, uh, we did the, we did the best vocals we did, uh, but when we listened to them, we heard the faults rather than the, than the good bits, and uh, that's just the way we dealt we dealt with what was happening with us. Um, you know, that's just how the band was. Uh, we were all right. We did. When I listened to the when I first heard the BBC tapes, I was knocked out. When I heard the Better kind of Days film, you know the uh, sets of six film. And we do we do better days, and we just nail it. And it's yeah. incredible to hear that nowadays because you never hear it on stage. Really. You can't hear yourself, you know. Mm-hmm. You know you enjoy yourself, or you know you don't enjoy yourself. That's about it when you're doing a show. Mm-hmm. You know, or somebody else does something stupid, you know. Uh, but obviously it was incredible to hear it still. Is. Right. is it possible that even back then you didn't realize how great the band really was? 
Yeah, well, that's exactly what I'm saying. We never yeah. thought the band was great. Uh, we thought we were good. We thought we were, you know, we were real good, and we, um, and we liked the we, we liked the songs we wrote, and we only took the songs that we thought were the best songs we had. You know, we didn't keep any. You know, Tommy didn't keep songs for himself. You know, to do on some solo project, and we had budgets. You know, when we signed with Warner's, they gave us all budgets to do. I think four solo records each. Each, none of us did a solo record. Mm. That tells you where the band was at, right? Mm. Yeah, that tells you where the band was at. They gave us the money. We had the money to do it. Never did. No, didn't even care. It just wasn't in the makeup of the band. We didn't think like that. No, mm. it's great. We enjoyed ourselves. Believe me, we were playing Carnegie Hall, things like that. People talking about us, saying, "Boy, these guys are great." You know, Rolling Stone uh, said, "These are, these guys are like the Beatles. And what the Beatles would be like if they got their shit together." <laughs> that's a that's a quote from Rolling Stone. <laughs> well, that's quite a compliment. <laughs> I mean, I think as a stupid. You know what I mean? <laughs> has there been any has there been any um talk about putting out some unreleased stuff, um, Joey? Maybe maybe some of the live uh, BBC stuff or or I don't even know. I don't even know if there is uh, mm-hmm. unreleased stuff because I'm I'm again I've I've never been brought privy in, into that. I've mm-hmm. never into that. They've never phoned me up and say, Hey Joe, we've got that we've got these you know, I went to Apple once and they told me uh, that they were going to release it. When the, when the new managers came in to Apple, they went through the bad thing, a catalogue, of course, mm-hmm. and they realised that Joey Mullen wrote a, a, more than half of the music. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, more than half of the songs were my songs. And they thought, well, you know, this is bloody ridiculous. Because everybody thinks that Peter wrote all the songs and that Pete and Tommy were some kind of magical uh, collaboration team, collaborative team. Well, they weren't. I think they wrote like three songs together. Three songs. You know, it's, come on. The, 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 the stories that people make up about the band to make the story work that they're telling, it's the bullshit. The bullshit artists, aren't they? <sighs> anyway, Apple decided that they were going to do uh, the Joey Mond album with just, uh, just my songs on it. And I've got the album here. And they said that the reason that they didn't do it, they didn't put it out, was uh, the, the Beatles uh, decided they were going to do the anthology. And, of course, it's the Beatles' label, you know? And if they decide they're going to do something, that's what happens. Mm-hmm. So my album, and it's, it's, it's okay, it's not the end of the world by any means. Uh, my album was shelved and put away and forgotten about. And uh, they, I, they told me about it in, I don't know, when I went over uh, and, I, and I went to the, the Cavendish, you know, office uh, to meet the people there, it was really sweet, really nice to me. Um, well, you know what? I was impressed with going to that office. And I know I'm going to get an aside here, but it was, uh, you know, they've got the Beatles first poster there. You know, they've got the, the thing, you know, things like that on the wall when you're walking in. Mm-hmm. Not like where it's three shillings to get in and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And the mentors, you know, where the, it's just fantastic. Uh, all the way up to, you know, the Sergeant Pepper Prince and, right. uh, you know, the Magical Mystery Talk covers, you know, all of that stuff. They've just got it all. In, and that's the magic of it for me. When I go in there, you sit at the table and, you know, it's like, wow, you know. We're running close to the end, end of our time, but your talk about the about the album, the Joey Mullen album, has me intrigued. I, and I just want to ask a quick question: it, Is that all stuff from when were those tracks recorded, Joey? Uh, early seventies. It's, it's stuff. All it's all stuff. It's taken from stuff I did with the Bad Finger Band. Okay. Uh, it's just Joey Mullen songs. Okay. Uh, and uh, there are a few uh, kind of like Do Your Mind, I think, is on there. Um, there's a few things like that, but it's it's not. I don't think it's stuff that you're having there. There might be different mixes. Okay. Thing. Okay. Uh, you know, so so that's what it was, and I think I was made up. It was really kind of an honor to have these guys sit there and tell me that they thought that my material was good enough to actually uh, bother with. Put, you know, because yeah. you know, really, uh, I do my songs on stage, and then people come up and say, "Boy, I like that tune," you know, whatever. But 
you know, because of the way it's been over the years, it's it's all about Pete and Tommy, and uh, you know, it is it has been about them. And you know, of course, I I make sure that I talk about those guys on stage, and make no mistake that it's uh, you know, this is a Peter Hans song here, you know. And, <laughs> Thanks, Pete. You know, well done. You know. Mm. Anyway, that's just the way it was, and uh, just the way it is. It's all good. You know. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much, Joey. This has been uh, a lot of fun. Uh, it's been great, and the information I, I, I mean, the the stories you told and everything are are really wonderful. So I thank you very much for for being with us today. Well, it's my pleasure. It's great to talk about it. Uh, and and. And good luck with good luck with the tour, and Thank everybody you. and everybody can go to what's the name of your website? Badfingersite dot com. Okay, everybody. And yeah. if you want information on the tour, go to badfingersite dot com. Again, thank you. Um, you can get a hold of the show by writing to things we said today radio show at gmail dot com. We have a things we said today Beatles radio fans page on Facebook. We each have individual. Pages on Facebook. My email address is beetlesexaminer at gmail dot com. Um, Ken, uh, Ken and Alan, uh, quickly give your contact information so we can uh, get out of here. Ken, <laughs> Ken, go go first. Ken. My email address is every little thing at att dot net, and my website kenmichaelsradio dot com. Uh, Alan. Um, you can reach me easiest at Facebook, um, either at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. That's it. Okay. All right. Um, go ahead, Joey. I'll say thank you to you guys, Ken, you know, and everybody. I know you guys. I've met you all over the years. It's great what you're doing, the way you talk about the music, the love you put into it. It's really great. Thanks very much. Thanks, Joey. Oh, th- thank, thank you. Thank you, Joey. Thank you, Joey. Thanks again to Joey Mullen for for being with us. For uh, Ken Michaels and Alan Cozen, this is Steve Marinucci for Things We Said Today, saying thank you for listening, and we will see you next time. Mm-hmm.